Good evening, everyone. Members of the Yale and US Governing Board, colleagues, friends, students, welcome to this evening's uh, symposium. And for those of you visiting Yale and US for the first time, well, we bid you a very warm welcome to our beautiful campus. Now, um, let me begin by first uh, thanking the, the main mover of this event, Professor Jeanette Ikovic, uh, visiting from Yale uh, University for this academic year. Um, uh, we hope she'll be able to stay a bit longer. Now, Jeanette has been instrumental in uh, bringing all of us together this afternoon. And uh, throughout the six months that she's been here, she has been working tirelessly um, to make visible the kinds of uh, thick relations uh, we have uh, with Yale, between Yale and US and Yale. And this is an example of the kinds of collaboration uh, that we should be doing more. And also she has been tireless in her engagement with faculty and students uh, during the time that she's been here. Now, as you enter the performance hall, uh, you may have noticed, some of you may have noticed, that there's, an, there's an exhibition in the foyer. And this is an exhibition curated by uh, students in Jeanette's course, Community Health Assessment and Intervention. Now, the students have used uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, methodologies to uh, detect pressing community health needs and to identify solutions. Uh, if you have not yet had a moment to see their uh, photo voice essays and infographics uh, on health challenges from pregnancy to old age, I would encourage you to walk through the exhibition after this session. I congratulate the students uh, for exhibiting their work and well done. <clears throat> now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Yale President Peter Salovey, who is well acquainted with our topic this evening, the future of public health. Uh, Peter Salovey is the 23rd President of Yale University and the Chris Agris Professor of Psychology and a Professor of Public Health and Management. Prior to his presidential term, which started in 2013, he served as Yale Provost as well as Dean of Yale College and the Graduate School of the Arts and Sciences. Uh, President Salovey has authored or edited more than a dozen books and published hundreds of journal articles and essays, focused primarily on human emotion and health behavior. Uh, President Salovey was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and to the Institute of Medicine and the National Academies. President Salovey has been a great champion of Yale and US, and I have personally benefited uh, from his support, guidance, and friendship. Now, before uh, President Salovey introduces the deans, and I want to say that we look forward to hearing uh, their initial remarks. I must apologize in advance that um, we may have to take leave a bit earlier than planned because of uh, governing board uh, dinner engagement um, later this evening. So uh, without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, President Salovey um, to open the uh, session for us. Peter, please. Thank you, President Ten. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here once again. Uh, uh, always love coming to Yale and US College. Um, I appreciate being invited. And uh, you know, I, every time I'm here, I reflect on, on this place. It was seven years ago when Yale and the National University of Singapore decided to create something new and took some risks to do it. So the traditions of the National University of Singapore and of Yale University came together to redefine what liberal education meant uh, in an ever-changing world, in an international setting, uh, at a time where complexity is increasing every day. We explored the future of higher education uh, on behalf of this great country, on behalf of many other countries who send their students to Singapore for a unique uh, educational experience. And I'm, remarkable, I, I, I'm pleased to be a, a part of this remarkable journey. I think what we are doing is changing higher education in Singapore, changing higher education in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, and changing it for the world. So earlier, I had a chance to look at the posters out uh, along the corridor uh, uh, that Yale and US students uh, designed describing various kinds of community health uh, interventions uh, from their course with Professor Egovix. And uh, it is very impressive, the innovative ideas that come through in those posters for solving global problems really suggests that uh, uh, so much of what we deal with has a kind of international 
perspective in, in that it, they, they, these are global problems, whether it's obesity or depression or uh, 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 smoking or uh, uh, what have you. Uh, these are problems, challenges that uh, cross borders and uh, don't really respect boundaries and, and borders. Well, I am impressed uh, among the students, uh, your incredible uh, commitment uh, to the pursuit of knowledge and to improving lives and society. Back at Yale, that's uh, the first sentence of our mission statement, um, to, to improve the world today and for future generations. Well, the leadership of Yellow NUS faculty members, and particularly Jeanette in this course, uh, comes through in the work of students, and uh, uh, I um, uh, am very thankful to them, and I'm sure the students here are too. In particular, I want to thank uh, President Tan Tai Young, Dean of the Faculty Joanne Roberts for their leadership, and I'm very grateful to Professor Ikvex for imagining this event and for uh, really being here this year to uh, uh, share her perspective and experiences with uh, Yale at US college students. So we are now going to turn things over to two world-renowned experts who are here with us to share their insights and perspectives about the power of education and research, and research that crosses disciplines and crosses borders. Uh, and uh, addresses global public health challenges and opportunities. So it's my pleasure first to introduce Stan Vermont, the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, the Anna M. R. Lauder Professor of Public Health, and a Professor of Pediatrics at the Yale School of Medicine. Uh, he's a pediatrician and an infectious disease epidemiologist. He focuses on diseases in developing countries and on health disparities in the United States. Dr. Vermont has conducted research on healthcare access, on adolescent medicine, on preventing mother to child HIV transmission, and on reproductive health. He's founded two NGOs, the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia, Friends in Global Health in Mozambique and Nigeria. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He's a fellow of the American Academy of the advancement, for the advancement of science. I'm also delighted to introduce Professor Tio Yeking, uh, who you know as YY Tio. He's the Dean of the Saswi Hak School of Public Health of the National University of Singapore, uh, the IOMICS program leader of the Life Sciences Institute, and an associate faculty member of the Genome Institute of Singapore. Dean Tio has gained an international reputation for his work in genomics, where he focuses on the application of mathematical and statistical techniques to understand the genetic causes of human behavior. I'm sorry, of human diseases. I study human behavior. He studies human <laughs> diseases. He's also, he also studies the genetic evolution, uh, he studies genetic evolution in worldwide populations, for example, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia. He chairs an international consortium investigating the genetic diversity of co cosmopolitan and indigenous populations in Asia. For his contributions and achievements to academic and public health, he is the recipient of numerous awards. Uh, he, was a young, he received the Young Scientist Award from the Singapore National Academy of Sciences, for example. And our moderator this evening is Jeanette Ikovics, who I already mentioned. Uh, back at Yale University in the Yale School of Public Health, she is the Associate Dean for Strategic Advancement, and she is the Herman Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences uh, in the Yale School of Public Health, and she is a professor also in my home department, the Department of Psychology. Here, she is a visiting professor, and uh, this academic year, she's serving as a senior fellow at the new Office for Healthcare Transformation at the Singapore Ministry of Health. Her research uses rigorous methods uh, and in a particularly culturally sensitive way to look at how biomedical and behavioral and psychological and social factors influence individual and community uh, health. 
Back at Yale University, uh, she is the person who studies health in the New Haven community in many, many uh, different ways. Uh, she works on maternal and child health and chronic disease prevention uh, and HIV AIDS, among other challenges. She's a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the European Society the, uh, of Preventive Medicine. So it is my pleasure now to turn things over to Dean Vermont. Thank you. Great pleasure to be here. Um, if you forget my name, you can call me the old new dean, as opposed to the young new dean. <laughs> so old new dean here. Um, one, one might ask the question, why Asia, why now? What is the interest of a university like Yale in a partnership like the one that we forged? And why would I be so keen to work with YY on uh, planning new collaborations and new uh, enterprises? So the way I look at this is I think historically. So in um, the 19th century, one could argue that it was the century dominated by the foreign policy interests of France and the UK, because they were disproportionately influential in the colonial world, in the history of the world. Um, by the 20th century, you had the two world wars. You had uh, American economic expansion and influence. You had the uh, Soviet Union, which didn't last the century. So you might think of the 20th century as uh, disproportionately influenced by America, by the US. And which of you thinks that um, the 21st century is not, in fact, going to be most heavily influenced by Asia? Uh, we have um, China emerging from relative uh, political and economic isolation. And we have uh, powerful uh, national blocs in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, even Central Asia, where um, whether it's raw materials, whether it's uh, innovative creativity of, um, of its uh, people, uh, I'm told uh, that um, I read authoritative information that uh, one third of all the code being written in the world is being written in India. Um, I, I, I know for a fact that 99.9% uh, .9 of everything we buy in the United States is made in China. That's a, that's a, that's a precise statistic that I calculated myself. And, um, uh, you know, ultimately, um, Asia is likely to be uh, not only the home of 52% of the people on the planet, uh, but also to be disproportionately influential in the 21st century. So we are um, motivated uh, at Yale University and in our School of Public Health to engage Asia in a very productive way because we think we have a lot to learn here. There's a lot of emerging uh, innovation and a lot of emerging energy from the Asian nations. And we think we have something to contribute. Uh, there may be uh, collaborative opportunities on the research side. There may be uh, collaborative opportunities in, on the educational side, like Yale and US. And um, there may even be uh, joint service opportunities where uh, the great country of Singapore and the great country of the United States would join in a triangle relationship to work in Cambodia, to work in Laos, to work in Myanmar, or another country that would um, need some assistance in, in the kind of capacity building they'd like. So point number one, why Asia, why now? I hope I've made it clear why. Secondly, um, we are interested in technology. We're interested in how technology can help us uh, anticipate uh, future needs of the globe. Uh, when we get into this topic, it becomes uh, too many technologies to count, so I'll just highlight a few. Um, we have uh, satellite imagery and uh, geographic information systems technologies that have uh, grown by leaps and bounds since I was a student and that make it possible uh, for urban planning, make it possible for predicting uh, emergence of infectious diseases based on, um, on a certain temperature 
um, humidity and climatologic changes that uh, will, in fact, in many cases, predict uh, resurgence of malaria, risk of dengue, and the like. Um, we have the smartphone technologies and the, uh, the short messaging uh, apps. Uh, some of them have been highlighted in uh, Jeanette students' uh, presentations outside which open up uh, a certain self-efficacy, a certain self-management potential, uh, not merely mnemonics to help you remember to take medicines, but actually health information, linking you to health services, linking you to social services, uh, and uh, the notion that something that is held in your hand can be a powerful tool in health education, health communication. We have um, uh, uh, changing uh, dynamics for diagnostics, making it possible for us to address health disparities. So uh, many parts of the world simply don't have a dermatologist. But there are apps that are now on your cell phone where you simply take a photograph of the lesion. Uh, sometimes you actually touch the lesion with the, with the cell phone, others are at a distance. And through photonic um, um, feedback, uh, typically um, uh, uh, through computer interpretation, uh, the dermatologists can be empowered from a great distance uh, to make an estimated diagnosis on behalf of the patient. Do you know that uh, some of the emerging microscopes have no lenses? They're all photonics. They're all driving laser-like beams, looking at dispersion patterns and determining what kind of cell type you have. So this may sound like, well, you know, th this is Star Wars stuff. How is that relevant to the problems of Laos? How is that pro relevant to the, the problems of Bangladesh? You know, is this uh, applicable to um, lower income societies? Won't this just be a, a play toy of, uh, of Singapore and the US and higher income countries? Well. You know, sometimes you have technology that helps you leapfrog uh, a, a, an older technology. And where we don't have adequate microscopy for diagnosis of bacterial uh, infections, for example, a uh, fundamental uh, thing we take for granted in the, in, in the um, high-income world, um, where, where we either lack the microscopy or we lack the reliable uh, uh, energy supply, we, typically we lack the personnel who know how to interpret the, the, sli the slides. Um, we may be able to use this distance lear uh, learning platform, this distance diagnostic platform with a very high technology and very low cost technology, cheaper than a microscope when you refine it. Uh, you may be able to deploy this in remote rural areas and really address health uh, inequities. Uh, in a way that leapfrogs technologies the way that cell phones have leapfrogged over landlines. I've worked in parts of Africa where no landlines were ever functional, and now um, uh, cell phones are accessible in remote rural areas. So that's an example of where technology can sometimes leapfrog an older technology, and paradoxically, the higher technology is actually easier to deploy. Um, and um, I wanted to close the technology discussion with the EMR, the electronic medical record, the whole field of health informatics, where we're trying to juxtapose patient data with genetic data, with um, social data and demographic data to uh, help us interpret uh, patient circumstances in a way that are far more sophisticated than we were able to do simply through paper records. Uh, it opens up research frontiers. It opens up frontiers of personalized medicine. It opens up frontiers of personalized public health and uh, planning in a way that uh, really we're just scratching the surface. And of course, the National Electronic Medical Record here in Singapore is being launched. Uh, and it's a tremendously challenging endeavor, but Singapore could be a nationwide um, um, electronic medical record, and we're still struggling, I understand, with, with making sure that uh, uh, it, it is universal in the country rather than a collection of disparate systems. And that's a struggle going on in this country at the present time. We've been struggling in the U.S. mightily in this area for the past few years, and we're making some progress, I'm happy to say. Um, finally, I'll close by simply talking about what I think is a vital challenge, integrating systems. So the problem we have in many parts of the world, and I'll use the United States as an example, 
is that the public health system is generally publicly funded and is through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, through the state and local health departments, and um, is, is funded by tax dollars over here. Meanwhile, the curative medical system is often funded by private sector dollars, a non-trivial government uh, input, but, but relatively passive in terms of management. So Medicare will pay the bills of the private sector hospitals, and uh, Me Medicaid will do the same for the elderly and for the low-income persons. Um, and with the exception of the Veterans Administration system for our, our Armed Forces veterans, we, we don't actually have government running hospitals. And so we have um, any efficiencies or savings over here in the, in the clinical services not talking to the public health services over here. And if public health services do their job, you're keeping people healthier, you're preventing them from going into the hospital, you're saving money on the curative side, but that does not get then reinvested on the um, public health side. That's a problem the Europeans don't have as much of when, because they have integrated systems. Their public health system, their curative medical system are one system. And the public health system, preventive medicine, population health, talks to primary care, emphasizes primary care, avoiding hospitalization, keeping hospital costs down through investment in primary care and through prevention. And that's a problem we have in the United States. So the cautionary note for Singapore is, sure, come visit the United States. Take a look at our system and then learn from us what perhaps you might want to avoid. Take some of the positives from our system. I'm, I believe that if you get sick, you're probably better off in the United States than most countries because we do have among the most advanced health systems in the world. But if you want to avoid getting sick, better live somewhere else because we're now ranking 30th in the OECD countries, the high income countries in the United States for our health outcomes, 30th. So we're somewhere between, sandwiched between Slovenia and Slovakia. And, um, and uh, this is with an investment, 18% of our gross national product, it's flirting with 19% now. And the um, uh, countries like Singapore, Japan, the Western European countries are somewhere between eight, seven, and 12%. So we're paying about double for inferior outcomes. So don't necessarily look at our system. And I think that this integrated systems is still a struggle here in, in Singapore. You're still working, uh, and we'll hear a little bit about that in a moment, uh, you're still struggling to make sure your population health, public health side is, um, is communicating with the primary care side and with the hospital sector side to try to maximize efficiencies. And we were happy to meet uh, with the former dean of the School of Public Health today to learn more about what the uh, Ministry of Health is doing to try to synergize this difficulty here in Singapore. The whole point is to reduce health inequities and to maximize health for all. Um, so these are just some initial uh, thoughts. I'm hoping that uh, there will be lots of Q&A from the audience, uh, a tiny fraction of all the challenges that we have in the field of public health, but a few things to kick things off and happy to uh, uh, welcome YY to the stage. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to start off with a reminder by Jeanette, which is that we are on Twitter, so you could actually uh, feel free to live tweet us. We are at hashtag Yale NUS Health, all right? So uh, I'm a mathematician, so people who knows me in the audience would know that I'm actually usually an introvert. And when I received the invitation from Jeanette actually to, to run this event jointly with Stan, my first initial response was to actually to say no, because introvert, there's not much you could say. But actually I, I thought that being in a setting like Yale NUS, a liberal arts college, actually really highlights what is the essence of public health as we move forward. And I, I will highlight this over a few examples. Because when we start to think about public health, 
And I would like to use my own journey in public health. I started off as a mathematician, became a statistician, became a geneticist, started looking at health economics, health systems, health services issues, because that is actually the progression as you start to look at the technology such as genetics. You don't just consider the technology itself, but rather you have to consider the entire array of disciplines that comes with deploying a technology such as genetics in different settings. It could be a high income setting or it could be in a lower middle income country. It could be issues around infectious diseases or actually trying to measure and stratify populations according to their genetic risk, like what Stan has mentioned earlier on. So this concept of digitization of health, it's one possible future of public health that we are already starting to see. But really, when we start to think about deploying such technology, whether it is in the use of mobile technology, telehealth, using genetics in stratification, in measuring the risk of people from suffering from a disease or even of future complications, one really has to move beyond its sole discipline of genetics or computer science or data science. But you really have to start to think about what is the accuracy? Is the health systems capable of deploying such technology? And this actually leads me to think about one important aspect when we start to look at the future of public health is actually this concept of multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches. And I will use a couple of examples and rather cheekily highlighted as we have to take a whole of government or systems approach when we start to think about public health. Let's look at what we have in Singapore right now. Singapore recently, well, about 18 months back, we declared a war on diabetes. This war was declared by the, the health minister and subsequently reiterated rather strongly by the prime minister of Singapore during our national day rally speech, which for people who are not familiar is very much like the state of union address in Singapore. Now, for a, a country's leader to address an issue such as diabetes in a national platform is unprecedented. And in fact, quite a lot of international press actually highlighted it favorably to say that, look, this is Singapore again taking a very strong stand in tackling what is likely to be an emerging health crisis. It is not an emerging health crisis because the health crisis is already here. But what approaches are we taking to address the problem of diabetes? It is not solely a health problem. It is linked to urban planning. It is linked to issues around how we manage our transportation network, how we nudge behavior is linked to financing. So when we start to look at a problem such as diabetes, it is very easy for people to just say, oh, this problem is a health ministry or public health ministry problem. But actually it's not. It goes way beyond that. It includes education, because when you start to think about diabetes, prevention starts from young. And it is equally a burden on the, sh the shoulders of the education minister as it is on the health minister. It is equally important to design your infrastructure, your transportation network that actually subtly nudges, nudges your population into increasing your physical activity. What about your food environment? I think you get the point there. The second issue that I could raise when we start to think about a whole of government approach is actually in the area of antimicrobial resistance. Again, if we start off thinking that antibiotic resistance is a health problem, we would have failed. As a public health community, as a health community, we would have failed drastically. Because when we start to look at the problem of antimicrobial resistance, where is the majority of antibiotics being used right now? It is not in human health care. 80% of the worldwide use of antibiotics is actually in animal husbandry. It is in producing the food that we need, that the populations need as our population sizes increases. So if we just start to think of problems like antimicrobial resistance as a health problem, we will never effectively address this problem. And I think this is where, when we start to look at many of our complex public health challenges, you will really start to see that it goes beyond public health people, it goes beyond clinical doctors. That is why perhaps my background in mathematics and statistics provides 
I like to say that it provides one with the humility to actually start to realize that actually the solutions to public health problems or global health problems need not necessarily come from the medical community. And in fact, increasingly, just as Stan has mentioned earlier on, we are starting to see solutions coming from computer science, from engineers, from social scientists even, when we start to look at how do we nudge behavior effectively to avoid the problem link to obesity and excessive consumption. Now, Stan actually also talked about integration. When we look at a problem, it is not just a problem where you have the industry coming in with solutions, the government coming in with solutions, but really it is now a marriage of industry, government, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, academia, and civic societies. So, I would again highlight a few examples. Earlier on, I was introduced with a background in genetics. So I will talk about drug-resistant TB. Right now, the way to diagnose drug-resistant TB is very quick. You could run a genetic test at a, at a very affordable cost, and you would be able to identify, is this patient suffering from drug-resistant TB, which you need specific prescribed treatment to be effective, or whether it's suffering from the normal drug-sensitive TB, which you start off with a first-line cocktail of five antibiotics. Now, I started off with this premise that we have a very sexy technology, such as genetics. But is it equally affordable? Because I used the phrase affordable earlier on, and I was rather specific and cheeky here. Because when we start to think about affordability, you have to look at the context. So when we start to think about global partnerships, we also need to evaluate global partnerships in local settings. Because partnerships between academia, between private industries that comes out with the technology may not necessarily be efficiently and cost-effectively deployed in different settings. Just imagine a situation in some of the lower middle income country with a vast expense of land. There is the urban cosmopolitan uh, cities, but you equally have rural areas that are serviced by health clinics that are very sparse. And how would a technology such as genetic testing, including the analysis, including the implementation, the interpretation, be executed in a low middle income country in a rural setting? So you would start to realize that even though we have modern solutions that are coming up, using new technology, digitization of health, the solutions are nowhere straightforward. And this is again where I come back to say, it is very fitting that we are having this discussion about the future of public health in a liberal arts college because it sends a very strong message that it is not solely a clinical healthcare problem. It is not, a solution. It is not an area where the solutions are coming from medical doctors only, but it is an area where you need behavioral scientists, you need economists, you need mathematicians like myself, you definitely need pediatrician, epidemiologists like Stan to come together in a rather humble way to say that we need to work together to actually provide the effective solution. So with that, uh, I would actually now hand it over to Jeanette as I believe she will now pose us rather interesting questions to get us thinking about what are the public health and global health challenges and solutions where the Eastern world and the Western society come together to address. So thank you very much. Go ahead, YY, you down the middle. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Musical chair. Trying to increase my step count. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, we didn't take a moment to, uh, to yet really give a round of applause to the students, but I really want to acknowledge all my students in uh, Community Health Assessment and Intervention for the beautiful exhibition, and Vicki Chappelle for curating that. So please give a round of applause for them. And what I'd like to do is begin by synthesizing a little bit of what I heard. I'll 
throw out the first question, maybe two, and then we'll open it up to you for questions and we'll, we'll bring it all uh, back around. So we'll start with, um, you know, I'll start with one of my favorite phrases, this idea of bringing evidence to action. To me, that's a lot of what public health is about. It's about taking the research, be it in epidemiology and statistics and genetics and all of the topics that you addressed and that we will come back to and really bringing them forward to make a change. Um, Stan, you began with a question, why Asia, why now, which I think you know really resonates with, uh, with somebody like me who's been here for just a few months, you who's been here for a few days. Uh, and in a way, of course, it goes without saying, but we should be explicit. Asia, Singapore, China, India, the ASEAN region, you know, this is a place we heard from Dr. Laurent Metz today, 52% of the world's population lives in Asia. And that makes it critical from a mass perspective, but also the opportunities to innovate, to create change, to develop knowledge, to implement that knowledge, and uh, to have the impact. We heard from both deans about the importance of technology. I think it can't be understated. And I guess here I'll try another pitch to the live Twitter feed. I have to admit I'm not a, a tweeter, but um, we, we wanted, you wanted to give it a try tonight. And we've done this at Yale a few times, and it's I been tweeted. very effective. So take out your phones, not to you know, text your friends, but to, to do a bit there. We can talk about the, neuro, the neuroscience of addiction later, but, um, but the good things of technology, anticipating future needs, satellite imagery, GIS, full genome sequencing, smartphones, apps, telemedicine, photonic feedback, I hadn't heard that phrase before, uh, distance diagnostic platforms, and distance education platforms, right? Just extraordinary. Um, laboratories in the field, you've been doing uh, you know, global health for decades, and I look out in the audience and I think about something like Valentina Zuin, and others in urban health and environmental studies and the opportunities for you know, real-time assessment and analysis. Electronic, you called the medical records, electronic medical or health records, integrated health systems, and so forth. We also see uh, the issues around integrated systems. Again, a theme that came out from both of you. Um, here we talk about, uh, I wrote a note about the insufficient reinvestment in prevention, right? We save money, we talk about value-based healthcare. There are all kinds of new solutions, social impact bonds, for instance, and yet we don't, we're not reinvesting those savings in prevention. I, we talk in my classes about every dollar saved, every dollar spent, can result in $5 saved, but it's hard, we don't see it, it's invisible. So we have to spend to save, and that makes it a hard, you know, a hard nudge uh, from a governmental perspective. On the other hand, YY talked about whole of government solutions, and if any of you have read my, my short blogs for the Yale School of Public Health about my perspectives being in Singapore, I've been so impressed with what I see from literally the night that we arrived uh, at the airport, you know, at two in the morning, uh, bleary-eyed, and the, and the taxis waiting in the queue that had the war on diabetes, and that said, how many steps have you taken? And I was just astonished to see that so publicly displayed, let alone one week later, as you say, hearing Prime Minister Lee on National Day say we have a war on diabetes. So I think there are tremendous opportunities here. And if we cut across, uh, yesterday we were getting ready to go to an Association of Yale alumni event, and uh, I, I like alliteration, so we came up with three Ds. Um, and, and uh, it was thinking about infectious disease, and, and the shorthand for that was, of course, the importance of dengue, and we'll, we should come back to that. We also talked about diabetes, and of course, the NCDs, the non-communicable disease, and then the changing demography 
That is the aging of the population, which hasn't come up quite yet this evening, but I know we'll talk about now. And the la I, I work in maternal and child health, so we know too that there's a lack of replacement at the population level. So you all can go home tonight and repopulate if you'd like um, and do some good for public health um, and society at large. Um, I'll close before, before writing my first question that global life expectancy has doubled during the 20th century, largely a function of advances in public health. Uh, in particular, reductions in child mortality, immunization, clean water and sanitation being some of the leading edge. And yet there's still so many challenges that persist, many that you've talked about and a few more that I've raised, urbanization, global migration, climate change. I think we have to talk about climate change tonight, smog, uh, emerging and re-emerging in infections together with the kind of antimicrobial resistance that you study and that you've talked about. We've got, of course, the sedentary lifestyles and the food environments. Um, my family and I love visiting the hawker stands with all of you, uh, but you know, we have to make, make good choices there. The environment is not always nudging us in those right directions. How can we enhance the lifespan? Not just the lifespan, not just look to another doubling of life expectancy. It's about enhancing our health span. Enhancing our health span. And uh, I'll talk about this again at the end, but I'll, I'll use this uh, as a pitch for, on, if you're having fun tonight, an April symposium on purposeful aging and meaningful endings, where we'll be spending quite a lot of time thinking about uh, delving more deeply into some of those questions. So with that synthesis, let me open it to the two of you and start with a question that takes us also that sort of builds on, and I so appreciate why, why you're, uh, both of you, why why kind of said it last, and I think sitting here at Yale NUS, and for students and faculty here, this idea, not the idea, the reality of our liberal arts college here, and what does that mean? And I come from a liberal arts tradition as well and really value that. And so if we think about this transdisciplinary perspective, Another piece that you both mentioned, but we didn't dig too deep in, is in a way the intersection of public health and politics, policy, but also in a way politics. And we have Singapore this year, for instance, heading up the ASEAN region. We have the Asia Development Bank investing in Asia and in health. And I think I'll start with you, YY, and ask, you know, on the one hand, can you, can you share with us some of your perspective of that transdisciplinary intersection? And in turn, uh, Sten, from your perspective, I want to set up a little bit of this east-west tension. So a little bit of the ASEAN Asia Development Bank, and then also some of the, you know, where are we coming together geopolitically, and where is their divisiveness? And in that regard, how does that impact global public health? So we'll start with you, YY, and then Stan. So I think you asked a question about the intersection between global health, local public health with local politics, and inter-country politics. Mm -hmm. So there are many aspects of the relationship there. And if, if we use Singapore as an example, Singapore's healthcare has, or public health has actually transited from a third world setting, very much like a, a lower income country, to a first world setting within a very short period of time. For those that always query about did Singapore really went through that transition within 50, 60 years, all you have to do is just look at the state of pipe water flushing toilets in the 1940s and 1950s, and you would realize that actually the transition has been very rapid for Singapore. We were rather fortunate because we had a government that did not need to spend a bit of time lobbying for political votes. So they had the opportunity and the vision that we need to make things work, we had to survive. Would many countries have the same experience or would they have the same trajectory? It's very difficult to say. Singapore also benefited from a very realistic fact, we are very small. Mm -hmm. 
So what works in Singapore may not necessarily work elsewhere. Mm -hmm. At the same time, right now Singapore is in a state of development where our public health challenges are very complex. If you look at a problem such as diabetes, the solutions are going to come from the integration of many parts in, in the government sector. Again, will we have the right solution? We don't know yet. So it is really waiting to see. But as a Singaporean, I'm rather proud to say that our healthcare system, our public health system, did benefit from having a political system that was stable enough. Whether the current political system is still something that is stable enough, that I will discuss with you over dinner later. <laughs> now, then the next part of, of your question is around what about Asia then? Singapore currently is the chair of ASEAN. And in, as the chair of ASEAN, our ministers have taken its role rather seriously, particularly our health minister. They are very interested to see what are the collective experience that we can learn in the, in the sphere of non-communicable diseases. So in November this year, there will be a ministerial dialogue amongst all the health ministers in, uh, in, in, in ASEAN mm. around the topic of diabetes and non-communicable diseases and other related issues. Now, Asia, rather interestingly, I like to make this rather naive uh, view that we seem to have coalesced as a community with the setting up of the Asian Development Bank, which is now bankrolling quite a number of health-related projects, not just in, in Southeast Asia, but in Greater Asia. But at the same time, we also have the Asian Infrastructure Investment Banks, the AIIB that has been set up, primarily driven by China. But you could see that my view is Asia seems to be coming together to address some of its collective problems, not necessarily in health only, but in many areas. But I would, I would make the statement that the situation in Europe and in America seems to be on the other end of the spectrum. Many countries are now taking a rather inward looking stand and this could potentially pose a significant challenge when we start to think about global health development around the world. But I will, I will, at this point, I'll defer it to Stan. You asked me to address controversies and challenges and potential conflicts. Um, there are many examples in our globalized world. Um, the SARS epidemic uh, more than a decade ago uh, revealed gross um, vulnerabilities. 95% um, of the world's population can visit any of the other 95% in less than two days travel. Only 5% live more remotely. So it's very easy within the incubation period of a virus, for example, to travel long distances and transport the virus with you. So um, proper global monitoring of uh, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, uh, the frank addressing of these uh, conditions in a global context uh, so that the globe can help control uh, emerging infectious diseases rather than a country or, uh, or, or a city is, is vital. And we didn't do a very good job with SARS, uh, but we did learn a lot of lessons. Um, we also have natural resource uh, constraints uh, that are tied to um, overpopulation of the globe, uh, global warming and climate change, and overuse of resources. Water is the most notable, and I'll just make a prediction, I think I'm going to be right, that wars 20 years from now are not going to be fought over oil as they have been for the last 20 years, they're going to be fought over water. And um, already we're seeing uh, bizarre circumstances of the state of Georgia and the United States suing the states of Tennessee and Alabama because there are old uh, Revolutionary War era 18th century maps, even 17th century maps, that um, say that the Georgia border is uh, two kilometers away from the Tennessee River, and that is uh, what uh, the, the border was drawn with. But now new maps have been found. They're not new, they're old maps, but they were recently found. 
um, that say that it abuts the uh, Tennessee River, and they've been in, in, in a lawsuit for a decade. Uh, and it's still not resolved, because whoever loses just keeps suing. Never mind uh, the West, where um, the state of California has been sued by the states of Colorado, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Nevada, perhaps Utah. Um, and that lawsuit's been going on for decades, because they're all angry that California is taking all the Colorado River water. So we've got many battles even in our, our, uh, in our, in our country. The tension between the Palestinians and the Israelis has been exacerbated by the Israelis using the Jordan River water upstream before it hits Jordan, and there are resentments there. Um, and uh, you know, the Sahel region of Africa is um, the desertification, as they call it, are 100 kilometers a year that the desert is eating up the, uh, the botanical uh, you know, uh, environment um, and, and essentially laying waste of what used to be arable land. A hundred kilometers a year, year after year after year, a hundred kilometers, a hundred kilometers, hundred kilometers, it's been going on for two decades. So we uh, are facing tremendous challenges in uh, shared resources. Mm -hmm. And you could argue that all the world's uh, natural resources are fundamentally shared, regardless of which borders they're in. We also have the phenomenon of uh, global pollution, where it's been well documented that uh, large uh, death, death uh, de uh, swaths of forests in northern Canada have been killed by acidic rainfall derived from um, Asian or origin pollution, particularly from China. And that uh, this can travel the globe and the rains can fall and dump the, the, the pollutants onto um, uh, pine forests in uh, northern Canada and kill them. And so um, whether it's the environment uh, that is uh, more the, on the land, uh, you know, like water, or the environment that's in the air, which can tra be transported, uh, the acidification of the sea, which is killing our coral reefs, and I always like to merge this, this fundamental conflict that we have in the world um, as uh, threefold. Uh, there is the environment and uh, climate change. There is the reduction of the diversity of biological species, which is, a, which is a fact and happening at a very rapid rate, which you could see as the, what we call the canary in the coal mine. The old coal mines, the, the, the coal miners would carry a canary with them because if they saw the canary drop dead, they knew that there was toxic air and they had to get out of the mine. So we talk about the canary in the coal mine. Well, the loss of diversity of global species, whether in, in uh, the oceans or whether on land, whether in our mountain environments, is the canary in the coal mine of what's happening to this world in terms of toxic exposures. Mm -hmm. And the third is, with all due respect to your recommendation that people go home and procreate tonight, uh, is overpopulation. <laughs> Because we're up to true, seven, true, we're, true. we're up to seven point <laughs> seven point four million people, which is double uh, the number that that were on the earth when I was a teenager, and uh, and I'm only thirty four years old. So um, you know the reality is that uh, that um, um, we do have a global overpopulation problem. Sure, we've got a demographic challenge in Singapore, where we have too few people in the working. Uh, category compared to the elderly category. We've got the same problem in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's exacerbated by the one-child policy in China, where they now realize they have too few working people in, uh, to accommodate the folks who are not working, the so-called uh, uh, dependency ratio, as the World Bank would call it. And so there are these microcosms where you could argue that there's an underpopulation of young people compared to old people, but on balance, there are too many people on Earth for the resources that we have available. Furthermore, there are 220 million women right this minute on the planet who have an unmet need for contraception. What we mean by that is those are women who want contraception, but they do not have access to it. So there's going to be a whole raft of children born who are, sadly to say, unwanted, were not planned, and uh, for whom families don't have resources to care for these children. So you can see how overpopulation ties into 
the pressure on the land and the pressure of resource utilization, uh, energy consumption. You can see how that ties into loss of species diversity with acidification of our oceans and, and damage to our, to our climate. Um, and these are interrelated concepts and they are going to be the topic of current debates where the United States recently pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords, a very moderate agreement of over 180 nations, universal agreement, they hammered it out so everybody agreed, and then unilaterally the United States pulled out on the, on the flimsiest of uh, uh, pretense. Uh, so this is generating global conflict in the political arena and generating I think ultimately um, uh, instability in our um, security uh, circumstances where civil unrest, I'm gonna end, I'm talking too much, but I'm gonna end on one point, which is do you know that in Syria, the worst droughts in, in recorded history were the three years before the outbreak of civil war? And many modern historians describe the, the pressures on the population of these severe droughts, the farms, the, 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 the contracting resources, the beginning of migration as a potential feeder for the, for the civil unrest and the civil war in, in Syria. I think we're gonna see a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna pitch one more question and I'll ask, there are two mics on either side, so we'd like to open it up. So if you wanna start to queue, if you've got a pressing question, please go to either side where the microphones are. Um, and I take it back, nobody go home and procreate tonight. I'm a good feminist. Uh, I unless am, you want to. Unless you want to and but you have access to contraception. If you're Singaporean, you should. <laughs> <laughs> we'll debate that. Good, good, good. Um, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Um, so please queue up for questions or, or stand up and, and ask your questions. I, I want to hone in. I just want to push a tiny bit and say even more, we've got this issue or are all just, uh, uh, you know, this issue where then when we think about, as you described and we kind of live through, uh, Europe, the United States, for instance, this divisiveness, this inward lookingness, the, you know, the, the, the natural resource constraints, together with the environmental degradation, the, you know, global warming, I mean, it's, it's a bit depressing when we start to think of all these things coming together in that much, much more than a perfect storm. But I feel, uh, you know, I think personally uh, uh, and professionally, there's this issue where the divisiveness then really can undercut our efforts in public health just as they undercut efforts as we think about you know political stabilization and 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 of course environmental um, uh, you know re reinstatement and certainty so i think that as we see the political changes and divisiveness at least in some regions of the world again may maybe we do look to asia as places of coming together but this inward versus outward looking and when we think about science crossing boundaries smog and water crossing boundaries you mentioned lots of examples of water flows here of course the mekong river coming right through and what's happening with damming and releasing of water you know the really, really makes a difference. And I think that when we have these political constraints, they do adversely impact the opportunities we have to create public health solutions, as well as solutions in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, there's at least one person. Why don't you introduce yourself, please? Hello. Um, yeah, I, I will, I'm Dennis. I work in a venture capital firm. I, I mentor for the Yale and US Entrepreneurship Society here. Uh, previously, I was working in the Gates Foundation in China. So um, yeah, maybe these questions are a little bit like China centric, but uh, I'll just like throw it out there. Um, because I mean, I, I still think about all, all these things even though I left uh, the Beijing office. Um, so we had our, our head of the, our China office, her name is Li Yino, and she's always like writing these angry letters to the head office in Seattle, um, saying things like, um, you know, China only has 2% of its GDP spent on healthcare, yet it's better um, maternal mortality rates and childhood um, mortality rates than the US. Um, and, you know, she's always very proud of all the like cheap 
like tin condoms that are coming out of China and the Shang rings and she's always trying to fight for more hit in the China office but Seattle office is always very re reluctant to give it um, I, I know that you know that there's always these uh, politics between uh, China and the US and even like Bill Bill Gates also has difficulty now you know trying to justify investing in the healthcare sector in, in China right he, he 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 just does very weak statements like you know, if your child has cancer, would you mind if the, the medicine or the innovation came from China? Uh, of course, you know, there's terrible things like the, 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 the fog and the smog that China also produces, right? But um, so what, what do you think um, can be done? I know, I know Yale has a, a center in, in Beijing as well, and um, you, you guys are trying to do something, but uh, I always feel like, like what, you know, the more globally minded people and, and even the health industry can do is also very limited sometimes. It's constrained so much by institutional and political factors. So we spent some time today, the three of us talking about China and if you'd like to jump in with some priorities in the region. Perhaps I could encourage you to stay at the mic. So you mentioned that you're, you're, yourself you're Chinese, right? Uh, no, I'm Singaporean, but I worked in uh, the Gates Foundation in China. Yeah. Ah, right, okay. I thought you were, you were originally from China as well. Because then I wanted to pose the question to you that if you were from China, what would, you be, what would your recommendations and what would your actions be going back to your country to try and effect some changes there? Because I think it's, it's often a, a situation where people are able to identify the issues and then but very quick to say that what would the experts do and instead of thinking about what it's the local advocacy that they could be doing in their own country. But now I realize that you're Singaporean. <laughs> <laughs> well, why, why? what do you think uh, some of the priorities are in China and in China in relation to this global conversation we're having too in Singapore and elsewhere? So I think Stan uh, would have quite a, a lot more experience with China because mm -hmm. my understanding is School of Public Health in Yale, you have three centers that are based with Zhejiang University and two with Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Yeah. But my sense is that it is very difficult to address the healthcare challenges in China because clearly the problems that are faced in Beijing, Shanghai, would be very different from the other sets of problems that are faced in the rural western parts of, of China and the inward parts. So when we start to look at the issue, I think clearly the, you mentioned a, a point that China likes to say that they have better outcomes in healthcare compared to America. At least and in certain I, areas, yeah. Sorry? Uh, in, in childhood mortality. In, in childhood mortality. So again, I think it, this is something that I learned from the founder of GetMinder, that we, we have to be very careful when we make general statements like this. Because even in America, when you start to actually dissect the data around childhood mortality, you see vast differences in terms of, of different social economic status uh, and background. So the solutions to some of this problem will not come from from general statements that say one population is actually better or poorer than the other, but rather to actually now to say, what lessons can we gain? Do we have the right data to identify which, are, which exactly would be the group that would benefit from certain interventions and programs? To, to go back to your uh, point earlier about the difference between Western and um, Eastern China, especially the coastal Starboard. So Shanghai has one of the lowest uh, childhood mortality rates for under fives, but there are parts of China, very mountainous in Sichuan, that are as bad as some parts of Africa. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variation. I'm just saying on average, the whole country. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so therein actually lies, you have, you have touched on exactly the point that we need to highlight, because then it is not essentially an issue around childhood mortality, but rather it seems to be an issue around access to healthcare and to access to quality healthcare. That earlier on, Jeanette, you mentioned about the, the equitable distribution. You, you talk about equitable distribution of value-based healthcare, but actually without going into value-based healthcare, even the equitable and accessible distribution of healthcare would already be an, uh, uh, an ideal that many countries would be aiming for, particularly a country like China, which has a vast geographical expense. So I would say the provision and the, the provision and the strategizing about healthcare in China is an extremely difficult issue. 
And it's such a big country, of course, with a lot of diversity. It comes back to the inequality issues that you really highlighted, Sten. And with YY having teed that up, would you just describe quickly the centers, the work that we have going on there, and the opportunities for collaboration? Uh, we started with a um, joint Shanghai Jiao Tong University, Yale University Center for Biostatistics. The purpose there was to help them increase their capacity to do clinical trials, to improve their ability to tackle um, uh, large data sets in the genomic arena, to uh, do uh, work in observational uh, research, such as uh, clinical outcomes research and epidemiology, uh, social sciences. Uh, it's been a very successful partnership, and both parties, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong and Yale Universities, have felt that they've gained immensely from this collaboration. There are several research initiatives that have been spawned. Uh, there have been very specific uh, educational partnerships to try to help Shanghai Jiao Tong get into the absolutely modern world of biostatistics, and they're going well. Uh, so based on the success of this center, we've started two new ones, one related to health policy, uh, at the uh, same university, but then uh, one on environmental health sciences at Zhejiang University. And uh, these models seem to be uh, positive ones because we're fundraising to support these centers in China and we're spending the money in China. And uh, Chinese philanthropists uh, uh, are interested in supporting Chinese institutions. We at Yale, in our, with our global health orientation, are interested in supporting Chinese institutions. So it's a win-win. We're, we're, we're able to engage China in a very productive way um, uh, with Chinese uh, support of Chinese institutions. And it's a beautiful example of capacity building that's going to be sustainable. It's not a flash in the pan where uh, some Americans drop the parachute, land, do some mumbo jumbo and go back home. This is embedded in the Chinese institutions, institutionalized in these institutions. And our whole raison d'etre is to work ourselves out of a job uh, on the educational side and continue collaborating on the research side. Yeah. And I, I wonder if I could just say one word about Chinese health. You know, this business of China's favorable health indicators. A lot of people forget this history. In the, in the 1940s, the life expectancy, around the time uh, at the end of World War II, life expectancy in China was about 37 years. And by 1968, which predates the surge of the Chinese economy, so not much s uh, improvement in the Chinese economy from the late 40s to the late 60s. But because of an emphasis in uh, public health, uh, the the, the, the um, slogan, away with all pests, and the other slogan, health for all, for the people, um, and the emphasis on primary care, which in the case of the communes, the agricultural communes, were the barefoot doctors, who were functionally um, moderately literate individuals who uh, were taught from a big fat book, um, uh, first aid and public health. That's what they did, first aid and public health. And the Chinese um, um, uh, exceeded uh, 62 years life expectancy uh, by the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. This is unprecedented world history that you could go in 30 years and you could improve life expectancy one year for each of those, of those 30 years. That, it's just never happened before. And this is in the face of the Great Leap Forward, which was a disaster, and the Cultural Revolution, which was a disaster, and, and agricultural pro uh, programs, which, yes, they fed the Chinese people, but uh, with some inefficiencies. So it wasn't like uh, China benefited from massive economic expansion in this time period. It benefited from fundamental investments in preventive medicine, primary care, and public health. And that resulted in this now. To get from, you know, a 60, I think it was 65 year, I misspoke a moment ago, 65 year life expectancy to 75 years, now you need modern medicine. But the Chinese have already gotten to this extraordinary level based on a commitment to public health and primary care, and people forget that story. So I wanted to say for students and faculty in the room, there are opportunities to collaborate with both schools of public health and to really bring your knowledge forward. There's infrastructure on the ground, so there's great opportunities there. Let's take another question, please. 
And intro uh, again, introduce yourself. Sure. So my name's Rohan. I work at a health tech startup. And what we're trying to do, we're very close to estimating your visceral fat using a smartphone camera. So with a vested interest in mind, could you talk a little bit about um, ways in which the diabetic, uh, the, bi the diabetes epidemic can be countered? Yeah, uh, you, if you want, go ahead. Diabetes, I mean, we, you know, it's, we, we've got an interesting Pete thing here, and we, our class was just talking about this, this w last week, this week, last week. Um, we certainly, you know, it's diet and exercise, of course, but Asia is so unique because of, you know, what we, we call, at least in, uh, in the States, the Asian paradox, this issue of diabetes without obesity. And so, of course, a question, and I'm curious to hear more about the technology at some point, but this idea of where is the fat located, femoral, visceral, you know, how deep, subcutaneous, and so forth. And so those are really important. We've got the human behavior, but we know that that is driven even more heavily by the environmental context, our cues to eat, and uh, as, again, as we were talking about this week, the issue of, the, and last night at AYA, um, the issues of, of even the engineered food being so palatable and in fact addictive, sugar, salt, crunchy, fat, all those things we love. So there's lots of problems. I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the shortcut and say, so what are the solutions? Of course, it's nudging behavior, it's changing the environment, and it's using technology to make some of those. But let me turn it over to the two of you. I think very similar answer to what Jeanette has said, because I think diabetes, if you ask me, I would actually not approach diabetes as a medical problem. I would try to look at it in order to avoid diabetes from setting in in the first place, what, would, what are the actions that would be required? So again, we have been talking about eating healthily, sleeping well, mm. maintaining a physically active lifestyle. All those have been with us for many years. And even with the new, the new technology, whether it is in lipidomics, or in genomics, trying to be able to predict a person's genetic risk of diabetes, I don't think that would fundamentally change the way we look at prevention of diabetes. Because just looking at the family history of diabetes already has been rather predictive for many years. But how successful have such advice by telling people, you have a family history of diabetes, make sure you act you exercise more and eat more healthily, how often people have, have stuck to that advice. And this is where perhaps where behavioral nudges would be very important. New technologies for doing that would be important. But fundamentally, I actually believe in one thing that is going to be, I feel important in this war against diabetes, and it is the way that we educate our children. Because there are studies by the Dunedin cohort in New Zealand that have shown that the ability to, to educate young toddlers growing up in an environment which strongly advocate healthy lifestyle and proper oral health, oral hygiene, proper dietary habits, physical activity habits, men, uh, sleeping habits to avoid mental issues. Those have already shown that educating the children have a knock-on effect in the way that they're able to influence the parents and the grandparents. So by the time that we start to think about behavioral nudges, the fact that we need to think about behavioral nudges meant that our education in the first place had failed. That now we need to nudge people to change their primary behavior patterns. But this is where, if I look at my own children, I have two children, one eight and one ten. For them, they were rather unfortunate because I am working in the area of public health. My wife works in the area of public health as well. She's a clinical nutritionist. So they have been brought up in an environment where for them taking fruits and vegetables, it's part of a normal meal. And, and I see that very clearly because that is the way that the children were brought up in the environment and you could see the behavior that they have. I can't say whether their behavior would change subsequently when they grow up and are more exposed to commercial efforts of, of high sugar, high salt uh, uh, diet, but at least at the very young age, I think the way that we educate our kids will actually change the way we prevent diabetes from setting in the first place. I've talked about children. The other area is actually in the way that we look at the environment for our working population. 
how many hours do we spend in our working environment right now? And often, if you look at what are the reasons why people do not seek uh, a physically active lifestyle or do not uh, pursue the right diet, it's all linked to environment around their, or the pressures around their work. And this is where I see health promotion at the workplace is going to be increasingly important, not just to governments, but actually to the employers and to the insurers companies as well. So that's my take. Stan, I know you could jump in, but let's take another question and we can build this out. I want to also pose something about mental health. We haven't even talked about stress, depression, mental health, which is we won't probably have much time to do. But let's take one more here from the uh, from the mic. And there's somebody else getting up. So let's take the two questions and then we'll uh, we'll close up and we'll be around for a few minutes after. But I want to respect everybody's time. Please. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Yi Ha. I'm a graduate of Yale University College, and uh, I'm actually starting a Master of Environmental, uh, Environmental Management program at Yale, and I'm really Wonderful. excited to see the uh, new Global Health Institute. Welcome. Yeah, um, and my question is, um, and I think both deans mentioned um, about the uh, current you know, uh, socio-political context of our current world. Uh, and we seem to be living in this age of, you know, alternative truth and people's faith in figures of authority is just in general on the decline. And um, linking this to the uh, public health conte uh, context, I think we have, uh, we have seen the anti-vaxxers in, in the United States. And I think in other parts of the world, um, public health and medicine in general are still considered to be very much a professional top-down um, affair that uh, some people are just uh, very d uncomfortable with. And uh, my question to three of you as um, public health practitioners and experts is, um, do you think th there would be a way to change this perception or like the way that public health campaigns are run? Because uh, on one hand, we can say that, oh, you know, um, the public needs to listen to the expert's opinion because we know the stats, we know the uh, epidemiology and they should be following our advice, but uh, could this be perhaps be a window of opportunity for a more citizen engagement or citizen yes. science, which uh, we are seeing increasingly in other fields? Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. And let's take one more and then we'll bring those together. Um, uh, I have a question regarding AI and big data. You know, as we move further into the world of artificial intelligence and big data, what is the role of human intelligence and what is the promise of traditional forms of medicine like TCM in future healthcare? Thank you. Okay, I don't know how you're going to do it, but <laughs> public health campaigns, truth, fiction, expert opinion, citizen engagement, AI and big data, and I sort of lobbed this bomb of mental health, stress, depression. So Take I'm gonna, one I'm, I'm or, gonna, I'm gonna or do the few. communication, he's gonna do the AI. How's that? <laughs> Great. Deal. Okay. So um, we're having a big debate in the United States around um, whether scientists are doing an adequate job communicating their discoveries to lay audiences. And the overwhelming consensus is that we're not doing a good enough job. So you can't have so-called alternative facts, which are another term for lies. You can't have lies dominate a, uh, a public discourse when uh, the population is well-educated, when you have a sophisticated uh, audience and they can't get away with lies. But dem demagogues thrive in an environment where people are believing the lies, just as in the era of Hitler and Mussolini, the big lie was a big part of their success, mobilizing support for them because lies were told about the origin of economic difficulties, lies were told about who were the criminals, lies were, were you know, Jews and others were scapegoated, uh, and it was, uh, the big lie uh, resulted in, 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 in the Holocaust and in World War II. So uh, we take uh, lies very seriously because we can have a lot of mini Holocausts. We can have the expansion of uh, uh, measles epidemics in Europe that are going on right now, which are derived from lies from um, uh, unethical physicians who are trying to make money, who published uh, s um, uh, selective data and claimed that measles vaccine caused autism. It was a lie, it was done for 
venal uh, profit purposes. Uh, and, uh, and we still have a mini holocaust of children who are now, who are now uh, getting, getting measles. I mean, lies result in bad public policy and result in bad decision making at the individual level and at the policy level. So the, the, the way I look at this is it's an immense challenge for the public health community in particular and the scientific community in general that we learn how to communicate in lay language what we are learning. And we learn how to coax, cajole, partner with communities as to what their self-interest is in, um, in prevention. And in the absence of uh, this sort of um, redoubling of our talent in, in health communications, we uh, are going to reap what we sow. If we don't educate people as to the benefits of vaccines, to the, the threat of climate change, then we're going to have people like Donald Trump who are going to be spreading lies and are going to be disproportionately influential in our society. Right. AI, big data. What about the AI question? No? What about the AI question? Because as you well, I'm from uh, the School of Public Policy, you know, and I was a medical student for almost 25 years. Uh, and being a liberal arts graduate, you know, uh, in a small yeah. class college, yeah. when I first came here, I was given a, 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 a PhD scholarship to help me out. So I became the first out yeah. to help me stay 30 years ago. But something in men that biomedical Because what is your target? Because we have the medical British type system. We are moving towards an American style system. So in some sense, public health is not a science, but it's very little of a role because uh, uh, well, public policy has a role, but it's a very little science, right? So, sir, I'm going to... But, 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 but my question is then, what is the future of public health yeah. in Asia and in the place of Singapore where we are trying to integrate the traditional the British type system, which has solved some of the public health problem, with the American style technology movement that's going to push up all the top and so on. How do you integrate that in the future? Well, clearly we need another hour and a half or many, many, many more hours to address all of these questions. Um, with respect for time and, and protocol, I'm going to ask YY to say a, a moment on AI and then what I'd like to do in turning your question a bit is ask each of our guests for the briefest conclusion of how liberal arts or how science arts and education, and, and, and we have many students in the room, what the future is for them and how they, you know, a very quick word of how we can use liberal arts education to seed the future in terms of innovation and ideas. So AI, Vicky, I'm gonna give you a heads up. I'll ask you to come forward with the three bags over there and then we'll close out and we'll, we'll chat for a minute more. So uh, in addressing the AI problem, I also try to address Kai Hong, your, your issue as well. So you asked the pr problem about uh, how can we marry the British system with the American system that seems to be driving out cost. So actually, when we start to think about AI and data analytics or the use of other technologies, this is essentially the problem because right now, if we just naively use technology, cost would go up because if I now start to use genetic screening for every female for breast cancer, how much would that cost the country? And this is perhaps where in the public health arena, we have to be rather judicious in deciding who to screen, what to screen, and what would be cost effective. Because AI has shown very clear results in the picking up of certain types of cancer where they have shown with the naked eye an expert physician would actually lose out to an AI-driven algorithm for picking up potential cancerous cells. And similarly, in, the, in evaluating blood vessels within the eyeball in ophthalmology, they have also AI shown, AI has also shown to be more effective at identifying who is at a higher risk of developing heart conditions as a result of thinning vessels. So it seems like there is a lot of plus points 
for the use of data analytics or AI-driven analytics. But at the same time, we have to sound a word of caution as well. And I, I, the first word of caution was what I mentioned. You have to be very careful in the use and implementation of AI. Would AI equally work for all types of cancers, for all conditions? Unlikely so. But how do we know which are the ones? And this is really where experts like him, uh, Prof. Park Hong, as a health economist, he would actually have the kind of data to make an assessment to decide what kind of procedures would benefit from an AI-driven approach and what kind of procedures would you have too many false positives that are detected from an AI approach. That's the first. And the second is, once you start to think about the use of analytics, data analytics, AI, genomics, lipidomics, gene expression technology, cost naturally will go up. Would the excess now be equally viable for all the countries? So I always believe that once we move towards a digital, uh, digitization of health without global support, the lower middle income country would actually fall behind a lot more rapidly because they will not be able to catch up and fund the excess, the equitable access to such technology. Great. So, so um, I'll ask you both to close. I want to, uh, you know, very briefly with the future. I think the future is really bright. And I think just even this evening in this short, short period, we talked about history and politics and psychology and sociology and economics and uh, uh, medicine, of course, and health and public health. And I'm missing a few, literature, the barefoot doctor uh, and, and others. And I think to me, that is the great symbol of, of of how liberal arts contributes not just to public health but to solutions more broadly. And uh, Stan reached over to say, make another pitch for your symposium. So on April 11th, Purposeful Aging, Meaningful Endings, Art, Science and Innovation, there are some uh, flyers around and, and uh, please look online and, and join us uh, then so that we can continue over not just an hour and a half but a whole day continuing to address many of these issues. Um, so the future is bright, I think. Many challenges, some seemingly insurmountable or at least a bit intractable, but where's the hope? Where are you know, some of the uh, opportunities from each of you? What do you see? Well, the, um, the liberal arts education, what can it contribute? Uh, so I was a pre-medical student and um, I did an interdisciplinary major in a liberal arts university. And for every biological science course I took, I took a parallel social science course. So that substantially empowered me going to medical school, discovering public health and doing what I do for a living because public health is so integrated between the biological and social sciences. So that, that was immensely beneficial to me personally. I also had my required quantitative courses, which having gone into epidemiology, uh, having facility with uh, quantitative skill set was an essential tool. Uh, but finally, I'll say that the number one skill that has served me in my career is the ability to write clearly. And, uh, and uh, my writing output has been uh, the backbone of, of my communication of my uh, uh, research results. Uh, it's been the backbone of uh, popular writing for, uh, for whether it's a blog or whether it's a, an uh, opinion piece in a newspaper or whether it's a document that's going to be shared to a wider community audience. So um, I, I just use myself as somebody who benefited enormously from a liberal arts education. If I had done the classic medical school sort of track in the British system, I'm not sure I would have been as good a writer as I am. I'm not sure I would have had the uh, matching uh, exposure to social sciences that I did. I'm not sure I would have had qu quite the mathematics background that I would have, and I'm not sure I would have even discovered the field of uh, public health and epidemiology. So I, I feel that I benefited enormously from a liberal arts education, and I think that Yale NUS offers that kind of opportunity for students to uh, diversify their background before they specialize, and that uh, is almost like the uh, base of your pyramid. Uh, sure, you're going to get to the pinnacle of the pyramid in your subspecialty, but with that base, it will serve you the rest of your careers. 
Three of our students just in the last few weeks had opinion editorial pieces published in the Straits Times. Amazing. So if you haven't seen them, go yeah. back and read. Yeah. Woohoo! Um, why, why? In the interest of time, I know Jeanette, you're rushing, but I would just have this phrase that I think if you're thinking of treating a disease, look at pharmaceutical sciences, biochemistry, medical sciences, medical degree. But if you're thinking about preventing a disease to, uh, from occurring in the first place, perhaps the solution lies in the liberal arts and social sciences. Thank you. Can't do better than that. <laughs> great, great, great conclusion. So I want to just say a few thanks in closing. Come on up, Vicky. Uh, I'd like to thank my husband, Tyler, wherever he is, sort of like the Academy Awards. Um, you know, just all the support in, in us and helping, you know, moving our family here for this period of time and enabling me to be here with all of you. Um, and also uh, Joanne Roberts and Tan Tai Young for their support of this series. Um, Samson, Brahin for and Vicky Poon and others for their help in, you know, the administ just getting, making it all happen, and Nabila and Gurjeet, you were here earlier, but enabling us to use this beautiful space today and in the future. Um, uh, thank all of you for coming, and uh, I want to thank, can I ask my students who have um, posters out in the exhibition to stand up, please? Vicky helped to curate that, and so I want, please stand up so we can acknowledge you. This is for you to thank you. This is Vicky Chappell for all she does. And these are for you in thanking you to remind us of uh, Yale and NUS coming together at Yale and US. Thank you thank both you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very much enjoyed it. Everybody, come uh, April 11th. We'll continue and give us a call, and we'll the dialogue will continue the discourse.